Welcome back. We're about to get into CSEC geography, and today's topic is natural resources. I am Dr. Robert Kinlock, and I'll be guiding you through the lesson. Let's get into it. So when we last met, we spoke about different in the sectors, um, the primary, secondary, and the tertiary sector. Today, the objectives of this lesson will center on the natural resources. We're going to be looking at some of the factors influencing the location of industries as it relates to the natural resources that these industries depend on. More specifically, we'll be attempting to differentiate between renewable and non-renewable resources. We're going to define the term natural resources. We're going to name and locate areas within the Caribbean um, that have specific natural resources that are used for commercial purposes. And these could include things like, you know, fishing resources, forestry resources, limestone or bauxite. And then we're going to explain some of the factors that affect the location of these industries. And we're got, our specific focus today will be on primary industries. In later lessons, we will get into the factors influencing the location of secondary and tertiary industries. We're going to finalize the lesson by looking at sustainability and the extent to which the practices that um, we have witnessed in our Caribbean region, the extent to which some of these practices represent um, sustainable, su sustainable extraction or sustainable use of these resources. So to start, we have to first understand what we're talking about when we say natural resources, what we mean by that. A natural resource is simply um, the materials or substances that occur naturally. And these can, are usually extracted for economic gain. Certainly within the context of our CSEC syllabus, when we're talking about natural resources, we are looking really at those natural resources that we derive some economic benefit from. And if you think about all the industries we spoke about the last time, um, they, they depend on natural resources in some way, shape, or form. Some depend on it directly, particularly the primary or what we call the extractive industries. They depend on it directly. So, the, you know, farming depends on, on the soil. It depends on the availability of water. The, it depends on, on um, the climate, or the weather. And all of, those could, those, all of those constitute elements of natural resources. Now, natural resources can be classified into two groups. These broad classifications um, are renewable resources and non-renewable resources. And these definitions are very, very simple. When we think about renew a renewable resource, we're thinking about any resource that can be replenished with the passage of time. And many of the, some of the examples of renewable resources are things like our forestry reserves, like wood, um, solar energy can easily be, it, it is continuously replenished and created. Um, well, not created, but it's, cons it's constantly replenished. Um, it is wind energy. Um, so all of these constitute natural renewable resources because they can be renewed quite easily with the passage of time. And some of you might be asking, but um, so can't everything be renewed with the passage of time? Well, not really. There are some resources that we call non-renewable resources, um, and these cannot be replenished with the passage of time. And when we're talking about the passage of time, we're talking about in the hundreds of thousands to the millions of years. Something like oil, for example, petroleum, takes about, it takes about 50 50 to 250 million years to, to develop. So most of our, petro, our petroleum deposits on Earth are extremely old, and so they will not be replenished in any of our lifetime. And so it is considered to be a non-renewable resource, cannot be renewed. Now, we have the Caribbean is rich in natural resource deposits. When you think about it, our economies depend quite extensively or quite significantly on natural resources. In some regards, we depend a lot on forests. Some countries um, like Belize and Guyana and Dominica, they have very significant forest reserves and, and it contributes quite significantly to their GDP through lumbering and, and other industries. 
Um, in other contexts, um, places like Belize have a very well-developed fishing industry. Guyana also has a very well-developed fishing industry. Um, we also extract across the Caribbean resources like limestone, and we take that from places like Jamaica and Barbados, and so petroleum and Trinidad. Trinidad is famous for their petroleum deposits. Um, natural gas also, we have very significant natural gas deposits in Trinidad. And of course, Jamaica is known for its bauxite deposits, but also Guyana and Suriname are also known for their bauxite, their bauxite deposits. Now you'll notice in, 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 in the combination of um, resources that were presented, you have different, um, you have some of them that were renewable, so Trinidad and, and some that were not non-renewable. So like Trinidad, for example, they depend a lot on a non-renewable resource, which is petroleum, right? Now, the harnessing or the extraction and use and processing of natural resources, these things come together to, create, to form the basis of industries and industries or can be simply put as a group of economic activities that might involve the extraction or the processing or um, distribution of, of, of goods and services. And so it, um, they tend to coalesce or revolve around a particular activity. Now, most industries have specific needs and, some of the, and, and these needs sometimes affect where this industry is located. So depending on the type of product, an industry might need to locate closer to the raw material. You have other circumstances in which an industry might need to be closer to the, the, to the market, to where it is, you know, distributing this, these goods to the consumers, right? Or might need to be closer to a point of export or something like that, a trading point. So um, it really depends on the character of the industry. And we're going to go through some of these examples in a few seconds. Now, the syllabus requires that you understand, that you get a, a, a kind of understanding of how these industries can be, how these factors influencing location can be classified, and a basic, um, understand, and a basic categorization of it could be what I have indicated here. So they can be divided into physical factors, um, things like energy and relief and those things, um, political factors and human slash economic factors, right? And when we think about the human slash economic, we're thinking even about social issues that affect the location of particular industries. So we're going to get into discussing some of the physical factors first. And some of the more commonly... Um, the, 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 some of the most common in physical influences. When we think about physical, we're thinking about things that are more natural, that have to do with the earth, that have to do um, right, with those things. So raw materials, the location of raw materials, the, 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 the location of an energy source or the supply of energy and relief represent three of the most important um, physical factors in determining the location of industries. So in the case of raw material, if the industry, if the raw material is heavy or bulky, so something like bauxite or sugarcane or coal, these bulky um, raw materials, these, they tend to lose weight on production. So when we're moving from, um, from, from bauxite to aluminum, of course, you know, there's a significant reduction in the weight of that of the, of the commodity, um, aluminum, is the is, is you know is, is extracted from the bauxite and then is later processed to aluminum but it when so when that, that bauxite is very bulky the sugar cane when it is cut is very bulky and so those industries need to be located closer to the source of the raw material so energy is also very important um some in those industries are very energy intensive and need to be located close to the source of an energy input. But what we find is that today, the pull of energy um, is less and less at a, at a local level. But some, in some circumstances, if you think about it on a global scale, many investors will establish industries um, or, or factories or you know, businesses in different areas because of cheaper energy 
availability. And that is exactly why um, we, we mentioned last in, the, in our last session that Trinidad actually has a manufacturing sector that's larger than the manufacturing center, sector for the rest of the Caribbean. It is really because Trinidad has this very good supply of energy compared to the rest of the region. And of course, that energy is from its petroleum resources. Now, relief is also a very important factor. Um, industries often need extensive areas. And when you look at, if, let's connect it to some of the, um, this is some of the lessons you might learn in your map work and so. Um, industrial, lo industrial areas um, tend to be very areas that are very flat areas, especially if this industrial area is an urban area, is in like an urban space or just on the fringes of an urban space. These areas tend to be located, uh, these activities tend to be located on flat, extensive land. Um, other industries, most industries tend to avoid hilly areas unless the resource, the raw, the raw material that they're extracting is in that hilly area. So relief does play quite a significant, um, quite a significant role. Um, now, government policies are, you know, represent one significant political factor influencing the location of industries. Governments do different things to encourage industrial location. So sometimes governments will provide incentives to industries, uh, to businesses to settle in a particular area, to, to establish themselves in a particular area. Governments may also do things like, um, and some of these incentives might be things like providing land or the infrastructure. Sometimes governments even give these businesses, these investors, tax holidays or tax breaks, right? So these are initiatives that governments use to attract industries to particular areas. So government policy can therefore influence um, the, the, the location of industry. And we have seen good examples of that in the Caribbean in the 1970s, going into the 1980s, and of course they eventually closed down for the most part in the late 1990s. What we saw, well, uh, perhaps in, in the early 2000s, I could say was the final, you know, kind of nail in the coffin for these industries. But what we had in the Caribbean was the expansion of export processing zones during the 1970s and 80s. These zones were located in port areas and many of these zones were, um, des were developed by the government essentially as a mechanism of attracting investors. Um, and so many of the products, uh, many large, um, international, multinational co um, corporations and, you know, many of these international entities like Tommy Hilfiger and other um, brands, for example, they established in the garment industry and they set up, they set up in these facilities there and they would stitch, um, they would stitch different pieces of material together, right? They'd import the material. Our workers in Jamaica would be placed there and they would assemble it and then they would export that material um, to their markets in the United States. Now, these are called export processing zones or free trade zones. And they are a good example of the ways in which the government, our government policy has actually influenced um, industrial location through the provision of incentives, of course. So another important component of, um, of industrial growth or for, for, industries, or for industries to exist, they need capital. So money is extremely important and money can influence where industries are located. Um, so that money can flow either from the government or it can flow from businesses or from individuals. And so that capital, if, if a government does not ha if have capital for development um, of these types of infrastructure, of, of these types of industries, then it will, it will certainly hinder the extent to which these industries can be, can, 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 can be developed. And of course, they won't be located there if there's no capital for that location. So this capital is used in things like setting up the infrastructure and all of these things. Transportation is also very important. And transportation, industries need 
very good transportation links. Um, sometimes that, that transportation links, the transportation links need to be um, such that it provides a very good connection to the raw material in, in, in the case of bulky commodities. Sometimes the transportation is, needs to be such that it can provide good access to the market and good access to the ports and good access even as it relates to the supply of labor, where your people coming from. So transportation is very, very important as a factor that influences um, industrial location. Now, another important factor is market, is a market who you're selling these commodities to. Industries all need markets for their commodities. And some industries in the Caribbean um, export products to nearby countries. Some distribute these products locally. But whatever the commodity, the market is very important. And in many instances, the market determines the location. Now, remember, I gave you the example just now about the export processing zones. Our location, um, bit, our proximity to the United States, which is a major market for some of these commodities that were produced in these export processing zones. Our location close to the United States meant that shipping costs um, would be lower. It meant that other items, it meant, it meant that, so if shipping costs are lower, it would be easier, it would, they would get easier access to the United States market. So in that way, on a kind of global scale, we could see where our favorable location influence it, um, it provides you know good market access so markets are very very important and of course the supply of labor factories often need a supply of large pools of labor now let us get into some specific case studies we're going to talk about fishing in the caribbean and then we're going to go into bauxite Now, fishing is one commonly used primary sector case study. Now, why is the Caribbean, um, why, is, why, is, why is the fishing industry so, so, so common or dominant in the Caribbean region? And it is really because we have an abundance of warm waters and a favorable climate and marine conditions um, provide, um, it, 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 it enhances what you call the biodiversity of the fish Populate of the of the of the fish, of our marine resources essentially, and what that does is that we have high levels of productivity in our oceans. Um, although as, as we will discuss in a few minutes, that some of that productivity um, is actually challenged. And when we talk about productivity, we're talking about it in a natural sense here. Some of that is actually challenged by some of our activities. But we have a lot of fish in our waters. We have abundant fish. Um, and we, re, many countries rely on this fishing, this fish, the, this fishing resource for, uh, for, 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 a, for a revenue. So what they will do, they will, you know, some will sell the fish to other countries. They'll export the fish um, in different farms. They'll, you know, they'll, it, they'll, you know, put, they'll, they'll, it, it, the fish will form a relatively important input into for example, the food processing industry. Um, sometimes, for some countries like Belize, the fish also represents an important component of their tourism industry um, because people will go on excursions to scuba dive and all of these things. But the fishing industry, in a general sense, can contribute or has contributed significantly to GDP in some countries. Some countries like Belize more so than others. Now, it provides employment to over 10,000 persons in Guyana. And uh, um, when we think about the, the fact that, you know, this industry provides not just formal employment, and it provides also informal employment. And when we think about informal employment, we think about all those people who would be like fishermen or vendors that are not necessarily registered um, with the government or so they're not, you know, so they, so, so these persons would constitute informal, um, informal fishers and they, they comprise a very, very large component of the 
of the, the labor market that is dedicated to fishing. So, as I had mentioned earlier, fishing also provides a lot of raw materials that are used for further processing. It provides a source of foreign exchange um, as we sell these commodities and gain revenue. And the foreign exchange, of course, and, and of course this, this exportation pro, um, contributes a lot to our gross domestic product, which we had discussed in the previous lesson. And of course, it is a very, very important source of protein, right? So we, we use it in our, in, you know, in our everyday meals. So we had, I had mentioned the concept of food security to you in the last lesson as well. And, you know, the fishing resources that we have in the Caribbean region do to some extent contribute to our access to food and uh, to our access to adequate, safe and healthy food, which is considered to be um, it contributing to food security. Now, what are some of the factors influencing the location of um, the fishing industry and how do these factors kind of play into why the fishing industry would be considered an important industry in the region? So one of the factors is the fact that the, coast, the, the coastal, we have very shallow coastal waters in places like Trinidad and Tobago and in Guyana and these shallow waters are rich in nutrients. Um, in some in, in, in areas like Trinidad and Guyana, they have large rivers like the Orinoco River in Venezuela that brings a lot of sediment, a lot of material um, into the ocean there. And the fish feed on this material and it, it enhances the productivity of the fishing population, right? So they, they breed more, you have greater diversity, more fish will be attracted to the area. And so our fishing or fish population will increase and so it will represent a very very useful resource for us um, in other areas in, in 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 both of those countries as well as in jamaica and all over the caribbean what we have are mangroves if you drive along the the coastline in many sections of jamaica if you're in portland cottage a lots of mangroves if you go to port royal you'll see a lot of mangroves as well and mangroves are extremely important because they provide a habitat or for fish and a spawning area or breeding ground for juvenile fish so because we have um mangroves and because we also have a lot of coral reefs in the Caribbean, coral reef ecosystems in the Caribbean, you will have the fish they go into these mangroves, into the roots, they go into the coral and they lay the eggs there and so the juvenile fish get protected until they are ready to take on the open waters. And so because of this physical, these physical characteristics, our fishing resource is enhanced. Now, what are some other, fact, uh, some other factors influencing the location of the fishing industry? Um, is the fact that many islands have very good natural harbors. And these ha natural harbors are good areas for boats um, to dock and for, um, and, and for ports that we use for exporting of commodities. And so, there is also a very long tradition of fishing for food and trade in the region, and that also influences um, that that also influences the the practice of fishing. Now, our engagement in the fishing industry, rather. Now, how is fish marketed? Now, a lot of fish is sold locally. Um, from um, some of them, some of the fish is sold to middlemen, and these middlemen take it to retailers like supermarkets and restaurants. Um, some fish is sold at local level in you know fishing villages. You can go directly to a fishing village like Old Harbor Bay, um, or even to if you're in Kingston, you can go directly to Raytown and you can buy fish at the seaside. Many local villages sell it. Now you also have um, wholesale markets that have developed and large, fish, large corporations that distribute um, fish, um, the resources of our fish supply. So, for example, in Guyana, we have, um, you have companies such as the Guyana Food Processing Organization and Georgetown, Guyana Food Processors and Georgetown Seafoods. These companies um, produce fishing, pr produce, um, these, produce, these companies distribute the products of the fishing industry to the market. 
Now, the fishing industry is an industry that is exceptionally challenged. Some of those challenges include things like overfishing, pollution of um, pollution by river uh, of both the rivers and the streams, as well as destruction of the mangrove communities. Overfishing involves the catching and killing of young fish, um, which cannot then mature to breed. It often contributes to that. We're also just generally just catching too many, too, too, too many, too, too many of the fish, and that or too much fish rather than that, and that contributes to what we consider to be unsustainable practices. If we overfish, then there will be less fish available. So we have to put in place mechanisms, and the government has put in place mechanisms to control that. Now, pollution also affects fish um, or marine environments. We have seen where sewage and, and other forms of chem, um, waste and ke chemical waste and other bio, what we call biochemical pollutants, these things affect the fish populations negatively. And of course, if we destroy the mangroves, there will be nowhere for these fish to breed. Now, if we were to zoom in specifically on Belize, Belize is a country that has perhaps one of the most developed fishing industries in the Caribbean. It is very developed because Belize has an extensive coral reef in the, um, ecosystem and, in fact, the largest in this hemisphere. Now, it has an extensive um, coastline, which is about 457 kilometers in length, and this coastline has rich mangrove swamps. Now, these mangrove swamps provide very good breeding grounds for the fish. Now, over 1,672 persons are employed in fishing, and most of them belong to a small number of cooperatives that own, that, that, that are owned, um, that these cooperatives own most of the modern fish processing plants. So the most important products that are fished out of the Belizean waters are things like lobsters, um, and these lobsters are caught in wooden traps or by divers in the shallow waters. Now, the Belizean fishing industry has been challenged, like most of the other fishing industries in the Caribbean. Now, the fish stocks have declined, and this has resulted, this fish stocks have, have declined because of overfishing. The fishers go in there, all of these large corporations are going there, and they just catch too much fish. So, and also, when you have this overfishing and you combine this overfishing with destruction of the coral reefs, some, um, that of course affects how much fish will be available. That sometimes a coral reef is destroyed by um, man's activities, right? We can't say, I'll teach you a big word for that. We call, we call those activities anthropogenic activities, right? So many of these activities, right, could, could, could actually destroy the coral reefs. So we, 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 you know, contribute um, to when we, you know, just, dec dis just decide to clear certain areas where we decide to, um, where we decide to perhaps release untreated or poorly treated sewage into the ocean, like what we have seen in, in Kingston Harbor, for example. Much of that, much of the coral reef, there's there, there virtually no coral reef ecosystem, no healthy coral left in the Kingston Harbor, and a lot of that has to do with a lot of the discharge of um, nutrient rich, and all of these nutrients, all of these nutrients really come from a lot of the sewage in Kingston. And so those things affect the coral reef, but also coral reefs are very, much affected by hurricanes and we saw in Belize for example where a hurricane had destroyed uh, or uh, destroyed uh, quite a significant portion of the coral reef ecosystem in 2000. Now various measures have been put in place to um, to protect the industry and these in measures really range from them imposing stricter regulations um, so they might decide that they, they want to close, they might have decided to close the season for particular fishes. So uh, I, I know in Jamaica, for example, we have a closed season for, the, for, for fishing lobster, for example. 
um, our lobster season is April 1 to June 30th. And during that period, you can't catch any lobster in Jamaica. And it is one of the measures that the government here has put in place to limit or to protect the fishing resource. Now, in, the, in Belize, they have imposed similar restrictions. Um, they also Im impose a restriction on things like the weight, right? The, si the minimum sizes. They say that um, the, the weight and the sizes. So they say, okay, you have to catch for certain species, it has to be over a particular size, right? And in that way, they facilitate or they encourage fishermen to catch larger fish, more mature fish, so they don't kill off, so they don't um, de de deplete the stock of of juvenile fish and therefore affect the, so the sustainability of that fishing resource. Now, um, when it, as it relates to the impacts of the fishing industry on the environment, um, quite often the methods that some of these fishers use can negatively affect the environment. They release, some of them might release chemicals into the water that affect, that, that uh, might kill large numbers of fish. Um, Dynamite fishing also kills large numbers, and oftentimes when you have dynamite fish, you, fishing, you kill more fish than you actually need. Now, another industry that we're going to talk about quickly is the bauxite industry in Jamaica. And this is another primary or extractive industry. Bauxite is a metallic mineral, and when that is processed, it produces aluminum. Well, we can ex extract aluminum from it, I should say. We can extract other things, but more commonly we extract aluminum. And this is in turn processed to form aluminum. And as you drive through um, many sections of central Jamaica, you'll see large bauxite um, deposits. And also, you, you might be lucky enough to see a few bauxite plants. Um, bauxite is very heavy, and so because it is so bulky, it needs to be located closer to the source of the raw material so that we can minimize the transportation costs. Now, um, a lot of the bauxite industry is funded by external capital, so external investors, but the government does own a stake in the industry as well, a comparatively minor stake. Um, it relies a lot on good, good transportation networks like roads and railways um, so to, to transport many of these commodities. And bauxite plants have also popped up close to the, the, the deposits, as I had mentioned earlier. Now, the bauxite industry um, has faced many challenges, and most of those challenges relate to the fact that there was a decline in the demand for aluminum on the world market. And so we have seen that going down. And also, our bauxite industry is challenged by competition from um, other areas, like other countries like Australia and Guinea. Now, on the, in the bubble, you will see that, um, that uh, bauxite plant right beside um, what we call a uh, kind of red mud lake, right? And though that red mud lake represents deposits of caustic soda, that is waste material from bauxite production. Now, bauxite has had a lot of impact on the, in, on the environment. This mining affects it contributes to deforestation, so they have to clear the forests to, 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 set, to set up these pits, to, set up to, um, to extract the bauxite. It also releases harmful gases because it uses a lot of heavy equipment. But there's also dust pollution, and dust pollution actually affects many, many communities that are located just around um, or in close proximity to bauxite plants. Um, that red mud that you saw in the previous picture, right, is caustic soda, and that uh, comprises, quite, caustic, comprises quite significantly of caustic soda. And that does contribute negatively to the environment, right? You're introducing a, a kind of foreign chemical in high concentrations into the environment. And so it leads to things like, in, like um, it affects the fertility of that area. Um, it, the, sometimes the material might leach into the water table below. Now, you have various measures that have been put in place to ensure that these industries are a little bit more sustainable. 
right? Because, of course, if we're extracting and extracting, um, you know, we are essentially damaging our, our, our industries, especially our environment, especially if we're dealing with non-renewable resources. And some of the practices that have been put in place in, far, in, far, in, in farming um, would, be, would be things like organic farming, where they don't use, um, where they don't use chemical fertilizers, they use things like ma manure, they, they'll use mulching, they'll use um, various soil conservation techniques, like when they put the soil, when they, they arrange the, the land into a series of steps to facilitate soil conservation and limit erosion. We had mentioned earlier where sustainability in the fishing industry is enhanced by reducing, um, by, by creating closed seasons, for example, setting, setting standards as it relates to the weight of fish that um, can be caught and, and um, also setting up areas that people should fish in. Right, so our area restricted zones for fishing, and they restrict these areas so that you know people don't necessarily so that so that the fish will get an opportunity to spawn. Now, that is it in a nutshell. We have covered the factors influencing industrial location, um, and particularly as it relates to primary industries. In our next lesson, we're going to look at secondary industries. But I just want to leave you with two quick questions. And the first is, which of the following groups of industries depend on the exploitation of non-renewable resources? Is it A, tourism, banking, or barbering, B, fishing, lumbering, or farming, C, oil, ref oil refining, um, smelting, uh, uh, aluminum, cement manufacturing, or D, food processing, garment manufacturing, and furniture making. So which one of these is, um, depends on the exploitation of non-renewable resources? The answer would be C, right? Oil refining is non-renewable, aluminum smelting is non-renewable, and cement manufacturing is also non-renewable. Now, which of the following industries, sorry, so another quick question, which of the following measures can governments use to influence the location of industries? And the answer to this one, because I'm getting the wrap-up signal, is D. Now, we have to end it there today. We have come to the end of the lesson. If you have any questions, send them to Television Jamaica's Facebook page at Television Jamaica or Instagram at Television underscore Jamaica or use the hashtag TVJ Class Time. Up next, we have Cape Management of Business. Thank you for joining us. It's here. Interactive classes for all ages on the School Time channel on OneSpotMedia.com. With a combination of live Zoom classes and recorded class time, schools not out lessons, and numerous educational content, we've created a comprehensive 24-hour channel dedicated exclusively to educating our nation's youth. Early childhood through to primary, secondary and tertiary, it's one stop on one spot for education, 24 hours. Brought to you by the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information in association with Television Jamaica Limited.